Welcome back, travelers, to the Eretzel World Building Vlog. It is episode two, and today we'll be talking about the Eastern Kingdoms of Eretzel. Remember that if you like what you see, do leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. But without further ado, let's get started. To begin, I want to talk about the Orklands. So the Orklands is a swath of land to the north of Suthgail. And currently there is a civil war between the two main chieftains of the land. So the Orklands is obviously run by orcs. It's not... I mean, more live there than just orcs. All of the monstrous races live there. They just live under orcish rule. And together they have built this massive tower city in the northeast of the peninsula. And that kind of serves as a testament to the strength and ingenuity of the Orklands, and they are respected worldwide because of that. Uh, the, you'll notice the ground is red. That is due to iron dust in the soil. There is lots of iron in the Orklands uh, from the volcanic interactions there. And I want to talk about the Worldbreaker Orcs. So during the history, there was an important war between the East and the West, and there was a general that stood up named Grotch Worldbreaker. He was an Orcish general. And he discovered that there were these vibrations in the world. Now, they were caused by tectonic plates, but he didn't know that. But he was able to use them to, you know, like when he stomps, he can break the ground with them and cause creatures to fall or take extra damage or whatnot. It's going to be a subclass for barbarians, an orc-specific subclass. And I'm really looking forward to designing it. But as far as the lore for that goes, we'll get more into it next week, probably because I do want to talk about that war soon. It is very important. But for now, let's move on. Up next, we have Suthgail. So Suthgail is the southern elven kingdom. There are two elven kingdoms. And quick note, I do want to point out that the elvish kingdoms and a lot of the east in general, I have not fleshed out very much at all. That's true for the entire world, but it's especially true for the east, just because when I run a campaign in this world, I'm going to be running it in the west. So I want to focus on that part of the world first. Um, but yeah, so Suthgail is the Southern Elvish Kingdom. Suthgail literally means the Southern Promised Land or the South Promised Land. And it was built by enslaved monstrous races, mostly kobolds. Uh, way back in the day, the elves invaded the Orklands and enslaved a bunch of kobolds and a few other monstrous races and had them build these grand and opulent cities that do look amazing. They are architecturally brilliant. It's just that they were not built by elves. They were built by slaves. And uh, the elves are going to have a lot of propaganda and revisionist history. I think that that's a fun thing to play around with, and I want to uh, utilize it in the southern kingdoms. Up next is Nuthgael. It is home of more elves, as well as Leonin, and a small population of giants. It's going to have a vastly different culture from the south. Um, they will trade together, but the Leonin and the elves are not going to get along very much. They're going to have very different cultures. And historically, every time the Leonin have tried to build cities of their own, the elves have stopped it, either through raiding or, you know, not trading with them anymore. The elves, for some reason... Historically, do not want the Leonin to become a world power. One thing about Nuthgile that makes it a powerhouse as far as trading goes is that it is full of adamantine. There are adamantine mines all over the place, and the elves know that, and they actively mine it to sell to the rest of the world, and that is going to be where adamantine is sourced from. And finally, we are talking about Karak. So Karak is the most interesting of the three to me because I love dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are objectively cool. So Karak is an island nation, but it's not a typical nation. There is no standing government. Instead, there are these sort of criminal syndicates that act as the authority of the islands. And there are two cities on Karak. They are called the sister cities of Karak, Cairo and Horsant. Cairo is the wall city. It's going to be built in to this cliffside face here. This cliff is about 300, 400 feet tall, and there is a massive city built into the side of the wall. And Horsant is going to be sort of a seedy criminal oasis. So this is Horsant here. And this is going to be sort of like Nar Shaddaa from Star Wars. It is the, the criminal hub of the world. And it's going to be a haven for pirates, outlaws, and military deserters. This is where anyone who's fleeing 
their homeland for legal reasons usually comes to Karak. But the most important part of this island is the fact that there are dinosaurs all over this part of it. So this region of Karak is going to be separated into three sort of elevations. There will be cliffs here and here, and it will sort of be like steps going up. This will be the highest part of the island, and this will be the lowest. And uh, there are these massive rainforests and jungles on the island that house all of these awesome dinosaurs. Um, sadly, though, dinosaurs do attract hunters, and there are these festival hunts all the time uh, out of Karak. As a result of these hunts, the dinosaur's leather, teeth, bones, and all of that has become a commodity. It's very highly valued in getting weapons and armor made out of dinosaur skins and bones. is a very achievable thing in the world of Eritzil. One new thing I'm going to be doing in these blogs is a new ideas section where every week just random ideas that I have I'm going to just share with y'all so that if you guys want you can flesh them out for your own worlds and then once I've done it for this one we can sort of share notes or just compare and if not then it gives you guys something to look forward to in the future. Uh, this week I've come up with a few cool things that I'm excited to share. One of them is this Ruin Claw either Monk or Druid subclass. Right now I'm leaning towards Monk. So if anyone's played Elden Ring, then you know that there are those rune bears in the world that have these sort of etchings on their chest and neck that is magical somehow. I don't really know what it means in that world. But I just thought it was a cool concept, so I've sort of carried it over to this world. There are these, I'm calling them rune bears right now. And they are bears with these magical glyphs and sort of tattoos on their body that they uh, can... If it's going to be a monk, I want them to gather key through them or be able to spend their key through these tattoos or have something unique about these tattoos that the subclass can do, obviously. And if it's Druid, I haven't really thought too much about it, but Druid does make sense thematically for this subclass because it is a nature-based class. But essentially, let's assume it's a monk. So a monk sort of forms a symbiotic re relationship with one of these rune bears, right? And the rune bear, during the monk's dreams, will appear to it in a sort of humanoid form and teach it these monastic traditions, right? And uh, eventually, once the rune bear has taught the monk everything that it can teach it, during the monk's sleep, the rune bear will disappear. And it, it's believed amongst the monks that... Um, this is a part of the spiritual life cycle of the rune bears, and that training a monk is one of the ways to reach spiritual maturity and therefore immortality. But, you know, there's a lot of iteration left to do. I think it's a cool idea, and I'm excited to, to uh, build it some more. Another one is this avarice idea. So avarice is just a cool word, and I wanted to do something with it, and I just had this idea. So one of my characters that I'm going to play in the future is a, a neutral evil character named Olaf Gideon. And he's a true nightmare. Uh, he's a bard, very charismatic, very talky-talky, gets what he wants, but he's extraordinarily greedy. And he wants everything. And the sort of, um, the, the one-sentence pitch, the thesis for this character is that if he could... Uh, burn down the entire world he would if he knew that he could rule over the ashes. He wants everything, and he's not content until he gets it. He's the D&D &D equivalent of, like, a little finger, maybe. Kind of. Little finger's a good comparison. Um, in this world, it's gonna be the same vibe for the character, same name and everything, but obviously not the canonical character in any way. Just a callback to one of the characters I've designed. But he will be an archfairy named Avarice, and he will be cursed to bear everything he ever coveted in life. So, um, basically, in this sort of godly form, he will be a amalgamation of just stuff. You know, like he's going to be grotesque to look at. He's bulbous and he just gross, just gross in general. And 
I don't really know how I want to do it yet, but I'm excited to look into that one too. These things are what I'm very excited about. This was just an idea I had. That I, I love it so much. I'm so excited with it. And this these these Genesimians, I think is the best way to pronounce it. But they are elemental apes. They're like Genasi, but they're monkeys. And they follow this god named Wukong, or something along those lines. It would be a Wukong-based character. These... Monkeys are very much like Genasi. There is an element associated to them when they're born. So, like, you could be a fire Genasimian, water, earth, or air. And uh, they are a monk society, mostly. They're going to live in the rainforests of the Gale in the Western Kingdoms. And they're going to be the um, monastic society that practices the... I forget what it's called, but it's the monk subclass that does the four elements. I think it's called the Way of the Four Elements. And that's going to be sort of what they do. That's that's their society. And I'm thinking of a um, like a breath weapon type deal for them, but flavored like the flame seed for the wildfire monks. Or, sorry, the wildfire druids. But we'll see about that. And lastly is Kernsworth. That's a idea I've had. I'd I haven't really fleshed it out too much, but it's like, what if you took the library from Avatar The Last Airbender and smashed it with the lecture hall from Bloodborne and have this sort of library that exists between realms and is meant to catalog everything that's ever happened for all eternity. For all eternity. Um, I've written some lore on this. I can't remember exactly what I wrote. I think there are 29 yuan T that are the lore keepers of Kernsworth, and they... To them, they live average lives, but relative to the rest of the universe, they live for a billion years each. But yeah, these are just some ideas that I've thought of, and I'm definitely going to introduce them to the world. And I hope you guys are excited for them as I am. So, in conclusion, there is still a lot more world to come in this little introduction arc of my channel. I've written some lore on Hell, the Feywild, and Beastlands, as well as uh, Norse Realms, and I really want to do a sort of City of Doors type deal, like Sigil. I don't know if I want to just incorporate Sigil into my world and have it connect to these planes, like it connects to everything else in D&D, or if I want to write a uh, sort of Nexus City of my own. If I did, I think I would call it Mementos. I think that's a cool name. But anyways, thank you for watching to the end. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed. It helps out a ton. And thank you guys so much for watching. Have a good one.